In this final video on capital budgeting and, and risk analysis on capital budgeting, we're going to look at something called simulation analysis. This is a computerized version of scenario analysis. So now, instead of looking at just one variable changing and having some distinct levels that we talk about, such as up 30%, down 30, 20%, etc., we can determine the, um, the risk analysis of each variable, having an average, some kind of a standard deviation, and we can then at the same time automatically choose all of those variables, have different values, and we will uh, put those different variables into the worksheet and it calculates the net present value. And we do this thousands of times. So this is what's uh, referred to in statistics. We refer to this also as a Monte Carlo simulation where we're just looking at random changes inside the uh, particular problem that we're looking at. So again, we're gonna calculate net present value and internal rate of return many times. Maybe we do it a thousand times or more. And in the end, we end up with a probability distribution of net present value and or internal rate of return based on these values. And generally, we're going to not just see the data, the numbers, but we'll also see the risk graphically because it will create a frequency distribution of all the values that we've generated over this 1,000, 2,000 times of calculations. So here's how this will kind of work. Let's say that the normal distribution of unit sales is 1,000. Standard deviation is 200. The normal distribution for the price is 200. Again, standard deviation of $30. So again, we know within plus or minus one standard deviation, it's 200 plus or minus $30 as the unit price, the, the cost. Likewise, for the act, uh, that's the, excuse me, that's the selling price. And then for the actual unit, the sales per unit, it's $1,000 plus or minus 200. So again, the computer selects these two variables. These are the only two we're going to change. But we could do this for every single variable that we have. So what it does, does this 2,000 times. And what we ended up with was, if you're looking at price, the average price was 199. Standard deviation was 29. We had a min, a maximum, right? Look at the units, 999. That's the average uh, number of units that we would sell. 211 is the standard deviation for units. And again, based on that, we could calculate net present value the uh, standard deviation was determined. The average, again, the median, excuse me, was around $64,000. So they also give us some other statistics. What's the probability that net present value would be greater than zero? So in this case, we end up with 3.8%. That sounds kind of low, but that's the number we end up with. If you notice, we have a pretty big minimum here as well, negative 142. And the coefficient of variation, again, is 1.65. So the inputs are kind of consistent with our distribution, with what we talked about, right? The means are in the ballpark. Uh, the mean net present value uh, is pretty close. Again, a pretty low probability of a negative net present value. Again, here we changed the values. Now they're saying there's a only a 13% chance of a negative value. Again, I would want to do the calculations. I don't trust that other number up there. But we could calculate what's the probability that net present value would be greater than zero if we have those statistics. 
Here's what our graph looks like. We talked about it. Looking at the graph, here's what net present value looks like. And you notice the what? There's These are negative value. These are positive. Seems like there's a lot better chance of positive than negative. But again, pictures don't give us enough detail on that. So what are the advantages of simulation, right? This gives us some statistics applied to the individual variable. So it gives us a little bit more sophistication, if you will. It gives us some ranges of net present values. And it gives us a graph that can give us a picture of the simulation of the risk situation of this particular project. Uh, the basic disadvantage is how do you determine the probability distributions and correlations of the individual variables, right? That's, that's part of the issue. Um, you know, some of them are going to be very flat, hardly any changes, but then some of them are going to, could be very volatile. So again, if, if the data that we put in here is questionable or not stable, then, you know, garbage in, garbage out, we could have some issues getting back out what we want for this analysis. Um, the basic disadvantages of this whole idea is that sensitivity, scenario, and simulation analysis, they don't provide us with a basic decision rule. They just indicate whether a project's risk is sufficient to compensate for us, right? Um, it, this analysis, they all ignore diversification, right? So they only measure standalone risk, which again, depending on the kind of project, may not be the most relevant risk for this particular project. If we could use the coefficient of variation, though, this is quite frankly one of the more popular ways we adjust the cost of capital. So if we can calculate the coefficient of variation, basically say, look, if the coefficient varies between 0.2 and 0.4, you know, what, what does that tell us? So from the scenarios that we've talked about here, from the scenarios, coefficient varies 1.4, simulation 1.65, and they're said basically, if this is our average range here, this is saying what, these projects are very high risk. So CV measures the project's standalone risk. So again, high standalone risk usually indicates high corporate and market risks. So maybe we make an adjustment. Add three tenths to the project's weighted average cost of capital. So that's again, 30% uh, above the base rate. At that point, net present value is around 41,000. It's still acceptable, even after we account for this differential in higher risk. Should we have some subjective risk factors? Well, of course, we should always use some common sense when we know things that we haven't been able to incorporate in the data, right? So if we know that maybe this project has the potential for lawsuits, right? maybe we want to add another tenth or two uh, or, or a tenth or so to the weighted average cost of capital to take into account those are different kinds of risks. And just to kind of conclude our, our discussion here of risk, let's think about what real options are. Real options exist when managers can influence the project. They can influence the size and risk of the cash flows. They can make decisions while the project is ongoing that can ultimately help to affect the market conditions and the riskiness of the assets. So alert managers always look for real options in projects, right? Smarter managers, they say, try to create real options, right? So being able to identify real options that are there is very good, right? It, it gives us some um, opportunities to take remedial action prior to an event happening or 
to really take into, uh, uh, into advantage uh, any of those positive real options and opportunities. And of course, if we can kind of create them, that's obviously, it makes us smarter, right? So what are some types of real options? Any kind of investment timing options will help us, right? Trying to determine when's the best time to buy, when's the best time to purchase inventory, when's the best time to uh, maybe increase production, any kinds of growth options that can come from a particular project, expanding an, ex an existing line or finding new products. We've talked about abandonment options. Those are certainly things that we want to be aware of as projects are ongoing. Then, of course, we're interested in flexibility, right? We want to be able to make changes as quickly as we can so we can minimize losses and maximize potential returns. <clears throat> there were some changes with the 2017 tax cuts that are of particular importance in capital budgeting. This has to do with depreciation. So in this uh, tax cuts, and again, this only applies from 2018 uh, to 2026. So we have still have another three years of uh, this uh, type of benefit, this bonus depreciation. But here's kind of how they set this up. They said in, let's take, 2023, that's this year, we can actually take 80% of the depreciation as a bonus depreciation this year. Next year will only be 60%, then 40, then 20, then 2027, we'll be back to the regular depreciation rates. So how does this work? If we buy a $100,000 asset, it's in a three-year asset class. We put that in service in 2020. So let's go back. It's in service here, 2020. So we get 100% of the depreciation in these years. So we get 100%. So that means what? 100% of the depreciation, we're going to write off $100,000. If the, the, the actual depreciation for that year would have been 33%, so there's nothing else to depreciate. So we would write off that entire asset in year three uh, or in the first year of this assets project. What if this was in 2023, this year? You would get 80% to deduct. So you would get a bonus of $80,000 and then the remainder, $20,000, would be depreciated according to the usual maker's three-year deduction rule. So the very first year, we would actually be able to deduct $86,000 odd as depreciation for this particular asset. Can this idea, this goal, even started in 2017, was to spur businesses into buying capital equipment. We wanted to expand production expand the purchase of assets. If you expand, if, if companies are buying assets, somebody has to build those assets. If people are building those assets, they're getting paid. If they're getting paid, they're going to spend that money in the economy. And they're going to spur the economy on. So the idea here of manipulating depreciation uh, is a great way obviously, of spurring the economy itself. So again, look forward to talking to you in the next video.